uh, Mike Corb. I'm the uh, a past chair of, of SME's uh, Pennsylvania Anthracite section here in in Eastern Pennsylvania. I'm a longtime member of uh, of AIME SME. Uh, I we we always called it AIME. We never called it SME until about uh, 10, 15 years ago, but uh, been a member for about 61 years. Uh, I Today is uh, Wednesday, July 27th, 2022. And AMA is recording my research on, on, on the Founding Fathers. Today is, we're going to talk about the first 23 me members of AME, the ones that were there at the meeting on, on May 16th, the evening of May 16th on 1871. And we're going to do a uh, hope. I hope they let me come back, and and do two more: one on the second day and one on the third day. Members, American Institute of Mining Engineers was founded in Wilkesbury in, in May 1871. And the meetings in May, May 16th, 17th, and 18th. There were 69 men became the first members of AIME. Today, after 150 years, the American Institute of Mining and Metallurgical and Petroleum Engineers has more than 150,000 members. And on May 16th, 1871, 23 men met at the Wyoming Valley House in, in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. And today I'm going to talk about the, those first 23 members. I'm going to talk about them in alphabetic order. Uh, just going to go from all the way from B to W. That's the start of the alphabet and the end of the alphabet as far as we're concerned. Talk. First guy is, is Joe Joseph Bram Herbert Bramwell. Sometimes mostly known as J H. Uh, he got probably got the prize for travel for farthest. He came from Dunbar, Pennsylvania Dunbar, Pennsylvania to Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. And that's about as far as anybody traveled that first day. He was a pioneer of West Virginia and, and what Southwest Virginia coal and iron and their development. He built ironworks in down in the, where the New River uh, New National Park is. He's been very involved with several iron other works, ironworks, and he was an owner, manager, or lessee. Later on, he became involved with the flat top coal field as an engineer and land speculator. The town of Bramwell is right at the center of that region. Bramwell was founded. Uh, he was the first postmaster and as the first postmaster they were trying to figure out what the name of the town was and he said well let's just name it Bramwell. He also was the president of Bramwell's first bank. He was active in AIME throughout his career. He gave uh, s several talks. He talked, uh, he had one of the meetings down at Roanoke. He was one of the hosts and, and took people on the tours of, of several of the operations that he was involved with. Also gave several papers and the biggest one was the investigation of the Pocahontas Mine Exposition, Explosion. And you might wonder why I'm talking a little bit too much about this guy that, that nobody knows very much about, but he's got a lot, lot, he did a lot of things that he's, a lot of things that, about him that people don't know, even in the town of Bramwell. If you take a look at the history of Bramwell, they don't even, they don't know where he died or anything else like that. But he also had a lot in common with a lot of other founders. He was, was a postmaster. Most of them all served as postmaster sometime along the line. A lot of them were bank officers. A lot of them involved with banks. Most of them did prospecting. They were engineers. They were managers. They were investors. And a lot of them were spec speculators. And most of them were active AIME members in for the most, all, most all of their lives. Martin Corio, he was one of the first three people that organized AIME. He was a practical engineer, and he was an example of the on-the-job training that was required of many, many of the engineers at that time. I'd say that probably half of the of our founders were, were college trained, and other half were, were practical people. His, his first job was on a Delaware Raritan Canal. He was involved a lot, with a lot of canals and railroads. He was a lot, involved with a lot of surveying. Most of his early career, he was involved in general civil practice. He was a, was a member of this American Association, the Society of Civil Engineers. One of those jobs was at Beaver Meadows Railroad and Coal Company. 
where he uh, met the engineer and, and f to be future founder of a big coal company. And Ariel Perdi hired him to survey, survey his Hazleton Mines, his first connection with mining. He then went to uh, Lake Superior Co Copper Region, Co the Keweenaw. He was his early su superintendent of the first copper mine on the peninsula. Besides being one of three men who organized the founding of AIME, Coryell was his first secretary, and he was one of the founders of, like I say, he was one of the founders of the American Society of Civil Engineers. In uh, at the American, at Pennsylvania Her Heritage Museum, there are two uh, two of, of the sa mine safety lamps that he used during his career. Uh, Samuel Harris Dado was was born in Cornwall. His parents brought their family to America about 1830, and he married the sister of one of our other founders, Jesse Beadle. He began work around the old coal mines when he was about 13 years old. Worked with his father in a, in a, in a mine there at the Oak Hill Colliery. Oak Hill Colliery is actually one of the collieries we're looking at doing a mine water treatment plant at. Later on, he advanced to charge of a colliery store, and he was he really didn't get much education. He just went to public school. He really went to just a few grades in school. But over time, he became recognized as an authority in geology, mining engineering. He was connected with the Miner's Journal, and he spent a lot of time gathering statistics on coal and mining. He wrote a book, Coal, Iron, and Oil, or the Practical Miner, also subtitled, A Plain and Popular Work on Mines and Mineral Resources, a Textbook or Guide to Their Economic Development. And that book was published in 1866 and was really was really a kind of a Bible of, of what had happened in the industry before that. He did a lot of the history of, of the heat. And the book is book is available online and still in, press, in print sometimes. So you can never, not, now and then you can get it on eBay. The first year of 1866, he also... He and Beetle opened and operated a company called the Miner Supply Company. They sold safety lamps. They sold uh, oil lamps, a lot of a lot of other equipment for miners, and also they sold uh, squibs, which were which were he and he and Beetle had invented. They ran a squib squib manufacturing plant plant in in Saint Clair. There were about fifty or sixty women that worked there, and they produced. 30,000 to 40,000 squibs a year. And during the uh, 1880s, about 90% of the mining squibs in the, used in the United States were manufactured there in St. Clair, Pennsylvania. The picture picture there on the right-hand side of the, of, the, of the ladies that were working in the plant at that time. Henry Drinker was the first mining engineer that graduated from Lehigh University in 1871. A couple, about a month after, after the first me meeting of AIME, he went to work for Lehigh Valley Coal Company. He later became a he was a, he was trained as an engineer and he had charge of the construction of the of a tunnel, which connected Easton to Perth and Amboy. And then he became a, a lawyer and he was became a director and general counsel to the Lehigh Valley Co Coal Company and also the Lehigh, Lehigh Valley Railroad. In 1905, he was elected to president of, of Lehigh. And he was the first alumni to become alumnus to become president. He this connection drove him to be get invo real involved with alumni. He established the alumni endowment fund, alumni Belton, and alumni association. During his years as president, more a lot of buildings were put in: Fritz Engineering Lab, the Drowned Hall, the Cox Mining Lab, and a lot of others, including the the, the uh, Taylor Museum and Fieldhouse and, and the stadium there. He, be, he had become president at Lehigh after the death of Ma Thomas Messenger Drown. Thomas Drown had been a, a chemist that had taught at Harvard, Lafayette, and MIT before going to Lehigh. He was secretary of AIME for 11 years, beginning in 1873, and he was president in 1897. Uh, there's an excellent presentation on AIME in Lehigh that was done by uh, a, a material science 
a student at Georgia Institute of Technology, the executive director of, of, of AIME and, a, and the president of AIME. And there's a, on the bottom of the screen there, there's a, there's a, a, a very long uh, connection to it, but it'd be probably easier to Google. In 1870, he started an analytic chemistry uh, consulting business in Philadelphia where he was working at the time of the of the founding of AIME. Most of his career, however, was, was academic. He trained at five universities and spent most of his time teaching. As a professor, he published papers on metallurgy and, metallurgy and chemistry. At MIT, he and, and the first AI, female member of AIME, Ellen Shallow, Swallow Richards, uh, helped, helped establish the first water quality standards in America, and the first modern sewage treatment plant. He was an intellectual with various, with interest in a lot of fields, and Lehigh's success really came as, as their featuring of technology. Drawn was popular with, with his campus people, and the faculty actually called him chief. Uh, they uh, named one, one of their halls after him in 1908. Ernest, Ernest Good Joe was my favorite guy. I don't know why. I just kind of he kind of strikes me as, as being a, kind of a neat guy. He was a French-born mining engineer. He migrated to the United States in 1864. He married a girl from from Tamaqua. Was it, she was the postmaster's postmistress's daughter. He lived for a while in for in Pottsville, next door to the to. Uh, William Simons, who was another founder of AIME. In Tamaqua, he worked for the Little Spokane Coal and Navigation Company for Frederick Brandy. Blandy, another founder of AIME. And he worked, at, worked in, in the, he had a mine of his own. He worked for Lehigh, like the, Le, the, the Little Schuylkill Coal Navigation and Railroad. And he actually tried to make coal bricks, a, uh, making briquettes out of, out of fine coals at that time. And that's something that, that was, was successful later on. His family moved to the Keweenaw in Michigan. And he was there for, until, for about four years. A family lawyer told a lot of stories about about Ernest, and, and a lot hard, harder to pull pull the truth out of it than, than fact. But we, it looks like he he probably worked for the Delaware Copper Company. He traveled to Japan and ate and for for about a year and a half. He was actually started a mine, a couple mines in 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 Hokkaido. During the uh, the Meiji uh, rest restoration, during that time the. The Japanese were trying to modernize. Uh, reportedly, he the Mikado uh, conferred upon him the honorary title of Lord and General. But in any case, he was people referred to him as General Gojo after that that time. They went to Ontario near uh, a town called Bellevue, which is uh, about fifty miles west of Kingston. There he was superintendent of the gold buying company, which was part owned by Richard Rothwell, a founder of AIME. A lot of mines, the mines, pretty couple famous gold mines up there, Gatling and the Laurel mines. He also was involved with a phosphate company. Later on, he worked in, in West Virginia, where he was a, a straw man for a, a big company called the uh, Coots Brothers. They bought the company that became the United Thacker Coal, Coal Company and, and owned much of the uh, that Pocahontas field that I talked about earlier. The pictures of where we uh, AIME didn't have any copies of these pictures uh, before before we started working on this, and it, the pictures came from uh, the Virginia Tech uh, uh, library. Ogden Height is the first guy I don't have a picture of him. I saw it, sorry, but I've got a couple of pictures about, about of where he worked. When he was, when, 
at the uh, founding of AIME, he was working for Richard, Richard Rothwell in, in Wilkesbury and just started working in for the Isabella Furnace in Etna, Pennsylvania. That furnace was there right by the uh, 62nd Street Bridge in, in Pittsburgh. And uh, there was, uh, he, he was, he wrote several stories about, about uh, iron ore and also about, about surveying. He presented a couple papers for AME on, on surveying and for copying drawings. Later on, he and his brother started a brokerage company in stock on the New York Mining Stock Exchange. The company had a kind of a sad ending. Uh, uh, well, the one brother committed suicide and Ogden was declared insane and, and died shortly afterwards in 1891. As far as I know, he's the only one that was certified to be insane. Richard, <laughs> Richard Bain Sick was, a, was an Englishman. He, and he was there employed as a mechanical draftsman. He worked for uh, his family for a while in, in, in Europe. And then he came to the United States and he worked for Cox Brothers. He became the chief engineer for, for John Henry Schwoyer, uh, another founder of AIME. Kind of, kind of an inbred society, actually, a group of people that actually worked together. He was a lover of music, quite a vocalist. And... He, besides him being a organizer of the Wilkesbury Oratorial Society, he was known as an engineer who rode his tricycle to work. And I don't have a picture of him, but it kind of looked like this, probably. Daniel Hoffman was a prominent end character in the early days of Lycans, Pennsylvania, in the western part of the southwestern part of the anthracite field. He published a uh, Farmers and Miners Journal. And he was did a lot of serving for the sur surveying for the coal company and and the railroad. He opened a mining civil and topographical engineering business, and then moved to Philadelphia, where he continued that business. He was the father of another founder, John Rittenhouse Hoffman. In 1878, he invented a celebrated surveying transit level. Uh, there's a picture of it here. It's a, this is a copy of it. It's in, available at the National Museum of American History of the of the transit. That uh, this transit cost two hundred twenty dollars back in eighteen seventy eight. It's a pretty expensive piece of equipment. Uh, Louis Sylvan Jones was born in South Wales. There were several Welshmen that were, were, were founders of, of people that were born in Wales and, and migrants. He worked in Wales for 26 years before he moved to the United States. In 1860, he came to America. He settled near Scranton. Later on, he moved to Wilkesburg. He worked as a, as a foreman of the Holland Back and Kidder Slopes and until 1871, at the time that he was, had just been made uh, inside foreman at Empire Vines at the time of the founding. The account of his involvement in 1874 firefighting at the, at the Empire Colliery Slope was related in, in the New York Herald in a series, series of stories called The Blazing Coal Mine. Went on for several weeks and actually several months in, in the, in the, uh, in the paper, they ran a series of, of stories about the fire and his efforts to fight the fire were, were actually kind of, kind of uh, successful because of some new techniques. He used steam uh, to, to isolate and, and, and put out the fire. The uh, new inspector of mines at that time uh, Thomas Williams, who was another founder of AIME, gave credit to Holmes in, in an annual report. He said this method really was, was the only, about the only thing they could have done. They'd been experimenting for use of steam on the fire for a week or two and then finally got, got it to use it. 
in, in retirement, he, he served three terms at Wilkes-Barre City, City Councilman and he ran unsuccessfully for mayor. He ran a good campaign, but didn't win. One of the great objects of the founding of the Institute was the greater safety and welfare of those employed in this industry. Just two years before the founding, a year and a half before the founding, there, one of the, big, the biggest uh, Disaster in the Anthracite region occurred at the Avondale mine. A ventilating furnace set fire to the timbers in the shaft. The, the shaft was over to over the, the the shaft caught fire, and the set the breaker at the surface, which was set over top of the of the of the shaft at that time, caught on fire. It was the only exit for the people underground, and the, everything collapsed into the mine and the debris, the fire. And the gases killed 108 men and boys, including two of the, and, then, and also two of the men who attempted to rescue them. I've always thought that, that the deaths of those 110 men a year and a half before that before that was one of the impetuses for, for the founding of the Institute. Lewis Jones was one of the men that attempted the, the rescue of the men, victims there at Avondale. He was in charge of one of the crews that was, was looking for, for people. Thomas Spirit McNair is a sign of, one, of a temporary, temporarily embarrassed family that had, had, actually had no money at the time that he was going to college. So he didn't go to college and he decided that he would uh, teach school. And he taught school for a number of years. And then he impressed on the uh, Pennsylvania Canal, becoming a, another a, one of the practical engineers. He became the chief engineer on the Delaware Canal and did all his resurvey of that of that waterway. Then he went on to work for Lehigh Valley Railroad, railroad engineering, mining engineering, a lot of important jobs in mining, a lot of executive positions in mining and power companies. He invented a number of, of surveying equipment, including a, a, a standard, what a inclined standard mine transit. This uh one of the this style of transit, very few examples exist. The one that was pictured here just uh, a couple years ago sold for more than $8,000. Uh, the transit was made to order for his for his biggest job in his life and that was running the, building the 15,000 foot long jet of mine drainage tunnel which was built by him and his boss, John Markle, who was the, an AIME honorary member. From 1891 to 1893, he was chief engineer of the General Mine Tunnel, and, which was considered at the time an engineering marvel. The tunnel was eight miles long. It, it dra drained 30, a 33 square mile drainage area. And right now it, it discharges about 80 million gallons a day and 400,000 gallons per minute. This is a, at, a low, at a low flow time. It's a picture taken at a low flow time. Fred McCurr was one of the first people that I've talked about actually that went, actually went to college. He went to Rensselaer and he worked on various surveys until about 1861, when he began working for the Lehigh Valley Railroad. He progressed right through the Lehigh Valley Railroad pretty well, and he was an executive at the time of his death. One of his first jobs, and probably what was most famous, was bringing tracks down the Wyoming Mountain to, to Wyoming. Today is the route of the Delaware Lehigh Trail that's being built into, into Wilkesbury. In 1870, he was made superintendent and engineer of the Lehigh Valley Railroad and, and supervised development and mining operations. Had about 12, 12 breakers that, were, that were, were under him at one time. He was probably the first that, that changed the practice of erecting a coal breaker over the mouth of the slope, which had pr produced the fatal results at Avondale. As a mining engineer, his opinion carried great, a lot of weight in, in the anthracite regions. He was 
taught my f fellow engineers and co-operators and actually was on the boards of several other, other, other buying companies. And you got to love a guy that had a locomotive and a ship named after him. And also a guy that's obituary read like this. He constructed the Le Lehigh Valley Railroad over the mountains into Wyoming. The commanding figure of Fred McCurr will no, be, no longer be seen on, on our streets. McCurr was a man who few knew other than his immediate friends. He was so absorbed in the exacting duties of his company's interests that his social nature was to a great extent repressed. He had no time for triflers, and persons doing business with him soon learned that dispatch was an essential. Skilled in the minutiae of coal production and all problems of civil and mining engineering, his executive work was not nominal but actual, and he could scrutinize every man's work or take its tabulated or statistical statements at a glance. In business, he was as fair as he was thorough, and the spirit which actuated him was as noble as it was exacting. The associates who knew him intimately recognized the nobility of his sour, where others felt only the shell of reserve. In his home, he was one of the most devoted husbands and kindest of fathers. In his death, the community had loses a sterling citizen, and his company a superintendent whose place will not easily be filled. My God, I'd like to have my my obituary look like that. Robert Chris McNeil was born in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania. He was. He was actually, he was also graduated as a mining engineer at, at Rensselaer. He then went back to the employ of his father, who's at William and Neil and Sons Iron Company, one of the first producing iron companies in the state, at Bloom Furnace. He first oversaw the mines of the company, and then he, later he, Rasperus. This red, there at the house in red is, is a pig. Picture of the house where he worked in 1871 and still existence. Nearly all the traces of Bloom first, however, are gone. There's a couple piles of slag, but most of the slag was actually put under the exit of two, 242 of Interstate 80. So when you're you just about across the, you're driving west from west, east to west on, on Interstate 80, just about to go over the the uh, Susquehanna River, you'll you'll could see some some parts of this, of this flag around it. In 1885, Neil became treasurer, general manager of Tyrone Company at, at Tyrone, Pennsylvania. And there's a town across this, just across the river from him, called Neilmont, named after him. It had schools and villages and, and cottages that attract what they called it at that time was an attractive picture of a neat and healthful working man's village. Tyrone also purchased the Morris Foundry and, and manufactured the Morris Rock Crusher. Thomas Mitchell Pretherick was born in, in Cornwall. He and his two, two brothers were younger brothers were all mining engineers. He was a captain of the, of the Follick and Souls Mine, one of the dark, largest, deepest, most important copper mine in Cornwall. He developed a mechanic mechanized hydraulic jig. That Pretherick separator kept kept the sieve stationary, but moved the water up and down in the hutch, so that the plunger would 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 create the wash, water movement. And that was patented, and it became widely used in a lot of bait minerals and base metals mines in, in the UK and here in the, in the United States. Thomas and his family migrated to the United States in 1843 and he settled in Pottsville. He worked with the Forestville Colliery uh, and worked for he the Heckershire, Heckershire companies. Later on became the New York and Schoolkill Coal Company and was owned by Moses Taylor. Moses Taylor, uh, financier and investor in, in, in the coal business, along with Heckershire and, and, with, and others. He also worked for the, the Anthracite Parish fa family, Charles, George, and Frederick. Charles and, and Frederick, both of them, founders of AIME. For a time, he also worked at the Lehigh Zinc Works. He had several patents for his work, for his coal breaker equipment. He was well known as a prospector, usually working for Taylor. And he did, did a, had a lot of studies of, of silver, lead, zinc, coal, and iron.
Among those who attended the first meeting was a man whose support was the originators felt was needed to give gravitas to the organization was Roster Raymond. At that time he was a 31-year-old professor of war deposits of Lafayette where he had gotten an honorary doctorate. He was the editor of the Engineering Mining Journal, which was the media arm of AI Media until 1877. His New York City office was called the Unofficial Center for the Mining Engineering Fraternity, and he was sec president of AIB from 1872 to 1875. He was secretary for, 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 tw for 16 years. Russell Raymond is one of only two founders of the National Mining that are in the National Mining Hall of Fame, and I think that's something wrong. It's something ought to be done about. He was honored because he was a, exerted a unique influence on young mining engineers throughout his exceptional writings and editing. He became editor of the American Journal of Mining, that's now the Engineering Mining Journal, and was there for 23 years. And he worked either worked on, with, ran it, or worked on it. He served as the United States Commissioner of Mining Statistics from 1868 until 1876. He wrote a lot of a lot of writing about the Western mines. He and his and and, and Anton Ehlers was were, were among the first tourists in in, in Yellowstone, what became the Yellowstone National Park. He lectured on mining geology at Lafayette, and later on at mining law at Columbia. He was consulting engineer for, for, se for several companies, last of all, Cooper Hewlett and Company. He studied law and was admitted to the law bar. Throughout his long service to AIME, he elevated ideals for technical professional societies in America, introduced European and geological writings to American readers. He was the guy that took, that wrote most of the of the obituaries for for the for the for the founders, and I owe him a lot of a lot a lot of a uh, lot of saved a lot of work for me, looking at, through those, and doing this. The the AME Rosser Raymond Memorial Award was was established in 1845 and it recognizes the best paper published in AIME in a given period, which is lead author is a member of third, 35 years of age or under, which was, was what he was, what he did was we really mentored young people. And at the eight, nine, 1919 AIME annual meeting, the Institute made honor to the memory of Raymond. And they later on published a 495 paper page memorial which contained a brief biography that that brief biography took four pages in length Richard Rothwell was a Canadian American mechanical civil mining engineer he was also one of the three founders of of, of AME the three organizers of AME he was educated at Trinity Rensselaer and also in, in Europe, at, at the, uh, in, in Paris and in Freiburg. He worked for a wire rope manufacturer. And, and he came over here, back to here, and he started working in the anthracite region at Eckley and it drifted in, in for, for the Coxes. He opened an office in Wilkesbury and was where his headquarters until 1873. For several years, he was an engineer for the Hazard Manufacturing Company, which was one of the first wire rope factories in the United States. He was an engineer for several company collieries and designed and built a number of coal breakers. He uh, uh, introduced underground, underground locomotives. They had uh, steam, steam locomotives underground at, at one time in, in the Lehigh Coal Navigation Properties. Also, one of his works were, were was a topographic contour map of uh, of uh, the the Panther Valley, the Lehigh Coal Navigation properties. It was uh, actually today people still look at that map. I uh, I worked for for a company that I worked for Bethlehem Steel when they bought after they bought the Lehigh Coal Navigation properties, and 
this uh, this picture, this map was was on my wall for for twenty years there. In 1873, his consulting, he, his consulting practice was probably so big that, that he couldn't stay, stay in, in Wilkes-Barre. He moved to New York. At that time, he also took over the engineering and mining journal as an editor. Became an editor, editor general manager, and owner of, the, owner of the company. He was president of AIME in 1882. He began publishing the mineral industry a uh, annual an annual survey of mining worldwide, and it was was recognized all over the world as as, as a great great uh, magazine. And he got got uh, honors from from several nations for for that. Justice Silliman, Sil Silliman, like many of his founders, were served in, in the Civil War. Some of them on each side of each side. Their generals, privates, all ranks, even a couple, like I said, even a couple rebels. Silliman was in the it was served at Chancellorsville and Gettysburg. In Gettysburg, he was wounded, captured, escaped, and was recaptured, escaped again. During the war, he wrote letters to his family and friends, and there's a book out that, that has, has those uh, battle those those letters in it, and they they've been published. And they also several of the markers on the battlefield at Gettysburg have quotes by Silliman, and actually his picture on a couple. He also had graduated from Rensselaer, and he was he ran the mining engineering and graphics at Lafayette at the time of the uh, founding of AIME. They were, they, they also had their first mining engineering group degrees in 1871. He was the first, uh, first endowed professor at, at, at Lafayette. William Henry Sturdivant and his father John were engineer surveyors and in real estate business in Wilkes-Barre. He was a county surveyor. He had was a civil engineer, city city engineer, for about fifteen years. He also was worked for a water company, water traction company, and a lot of other of the city utilities. He's well known for his map making. Uh, he made several city city atlas city atlases and local local uh, mapping. Great resources for, for for anybody that's looking at, at, at what was going on at that time. William Richard Simons was born in Cornwall. He worked at a tin mine as a child, and he studied in civil and mining engineering under his un uncle Robert. His uncle Robert was a famous map maker, uh, mapping uh, uh, Publishing the first maps of Cornwall showing uh, geology and in eighteen seventy six he came to the United States. He moved to Pottsburgville. He worked at Yorktown Mine for George K. Smith for about three years. I mentioned George K. Smith just because he was the first if you're talking a little bit about Ant the anthracite region, you got to talk about the Molly Maguires. And George K. Smith was one of the first people that, would, that, the, that the executed Molly Maguires had, were charged with murdering. Simons went back to Cornwall. He worked with, again with his uncle and his cousin. He married and returned to the States. For some time he was here, he was the chief engineer for Lehigh Coal Navigation Company. He did a lot of work in the Tamaqua area with the ge geologic survey and with private practice. And most of those guys, fairly well known. Somebody knew a little bit about him, had written something about him. And 
but we got a couple that, that hardly anybody knows about, and one of them was James W. Thomas. James Thomas, we're gathering information at that, and that list, we're looking right in the middle of the list there, there's, there's this guy, James Thomas in Wilkesbury. But obviously we thought we, we thought he was a, maybe a Welshman. Uh, about half the, the 69 members were immigrants, but many of those were from Wales. In the mid-1880s, mid uh, the mines and factories were growing and, and a lot of still, skilled workers came from Wales to America. A lot of these people knew a lot about making iron, mining coal, some from southern Wales. In 1870, the U.S. Census had, had 120 James Thomases. I, of course, thought, well, maybe he was, was related to, to David Thomas, who was uh, the first day first president of AIME and we started Thomas Ironworks. But that 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 trail went out. Our searches I searched in the in the all of the uh, censuses. There were a lot of people who worked for mines, that were miners, were foremen, were worked in mine, they were mule drivers, they were laborers. But finally I found this guy that was J. W. Thomas, a boss of the mines. In fact there was a couple of the early meetings, reports from ENMJ had somebody identified as both James, what was James, referred to in the AME records as James Thomas, as J.A. Thomas and J.W. Thomas. So I decided that, that James Thomas, that our James Thomas was a James Thomas who was born in 1813, came to the United States in 1846, lived in Pottsville called himself a coal operator, moved to Wilkesbury. Was a boss of the mines, a coal operator, and, and was a uh, alderman appointed by Governor Holt. He was defeated for election. He worked for Swears Coal as a, as an agent, and he was when he died he was named it, honored as a good old man. He never had any mention of AIME in, in News Thomas's, but I decided that he is James Thomas. James Addy Simpson was involved in financial services in New York and was a director of several companies, including Columbia Fire Insurance, before, before he came to Wilkesbury. He served in the Civil War a short time. He recognized the future of anthracite and had an opportunity, opportunity to invest in it. He and others formed, purchased in the Hartford Mine and actually it formed the Lehigh Susquehanna Coal Company becoming sub of the Lehigh Susquehanna Railroad and the Lehigh Coal Navigation Company. I'm not sure where he got his money, but I, I do know that his brother was a, was involved in, in uh, a brokerage company in, in New York, and I, I know that one of the brothers worked for it. I would think maybe that's where some of the money came from. The Hartford Mine owned this part of, of, of Pennsylvania, and as you can see, the Hartford Mine there right a couple of the parts of it right in the middle of it. In 1871, he had just re recently retired as president of, of that company, Lehigh Susquehanna Coal Company. The coal company had been leased to Lehigh Wilkesbury Coal Company, and the railroad had been leased to the Central Railroad of New Jersey. He lived the rest of his life, 36 years, being a coal pioneer celebrity, reaching, representing the company, uh, the Central New Railroad of New Jersey, the Lehigh and Wilkesbury Coal Company, the Lehigh Coal Navigation Company, as as a celebrity, he was at events. He went to he spent the summertime in a Lead Summit Hotel, which is up in the mountain above Wilkesbury, and at the Wyoming Valley Hotel during the rest of the year. He wasn't an engineer, but he was living in the Wyoming Valley House and where the meeting was, and one of his responsibilities he had for the as a coal pioneer was to to lead the tour, so he went to the meeting and became a member of the, of the, the AIME. Willard Parker Ward was known as the first baker of ferromanganese in the United States. He was also the a assistant editor of the Engineering and Mining Journal in 1871, working for Rosser Raymond. 
He was also the manager of the scientific publishing, which owned the, the engineering and mining journal. That first ferromanganese was manufactured in, in Barstow, near Barstow, Georgia, at the Union Diamond Furnace. The remains are, are not very well preserved today, but also then he went on to be uh, involved in a lot of gold mine silk, silk projects in the West. He was involved with the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. He was head of a lot of other diverse companies called the whiskey, even the Whiskey Trust and people that made Gordon's gin today. I think he did pretty well financially. He uh, owned several yachts out of the New York Yacht Club. He visited with President Cleveland and Adirondacks, had a couple bungalows in Narragansett. If you want a nice vac vacation, you could actually rent a, a, a week at the smaller one of those for $25,000 a week. No pets allowed. If you remember, I'm going to, the alphabet goes for, from B to W, and Morgan, Thomas Morgan Williams is the last of the we can talk about today. When he was seven years old, he worked with Stepfather in Walsh Mines, and with his mother and, and, and her child and her, his half-sister, they came from Liverpool to America at the age of 13. He then worked here in the mines, first in Minersville, and, and then moved to Maryland and went to work there. And he got his first 12 days of schooling, and that was the only 12 d d days of schooling he had. He were, we came back to Minersville and extended. Uh, attended school for another day and another night. After serving in the Civil War, he worked in the mines as a fire boss. He was a boss of mines, and he worked for Charles Parrish, one of the founders of AIME, in his mines for about 10 years. He was the first inspector of mines in the Wyoming region, his second, second inspector in, in, in Pennsylvania in 1870. And it was at the time of the founding, he was at one of the inspect, one of, that's where he was working. Previous, he was also an officer in the Workingmen's Benevolent Association. Sounds like might have been a little bit of conflict of interest working for the union and and being an inspector of mines. He was also manager of the Anthracite Monitor, a newspaper that they published in in, in Tamaqua. It was a definitely a, a labor a labor paper. He, had, he was a vocal pa activist for passage of the mine law. He was a Welshman, had labor condition, con connections, activism for the strike and law. And when he, when he got appointment, all of those things and where he had worked before was an awful lot of comments. He was involved also in, in the Night Shaft fire. A famous, uh, they call it West Pit, Pits and Fire Disaster. And we'll talk. I'll talk a little bit about that next. In my next uh, talk about, about about the second day members. After ten years as Inspector Mines, he worked as a superintendent of the Likens Valley and Summit Valley Coal Company, where he and his boss Irving Stearns, another AIME member were introduced the first electric locomotive in the United States. That locomotive is now at the Henry Ford in, in Dearborn. So that's all, folks, uh, but not really. I hope you could recommend this and you'll like to see it and, and like to come back because I still have two more that they promised me I can do. Day two and day three of the first meeting. I kind of think that, that some of the others are as interesting or more, that even more so perhaps than the original 23. And I think you all also. So stay tuned for that. Thank you very much for being here today.